you've mentioned uncertainty with the questions, but actually what I'll hopefully highlight with this talk is there's a lot of uncertainty with uh, a lot of things we do in medicine. So before I talk about the project I'm involved with called the Reversible Dementia Project, I'll just talk a bit about, just very briefly about, um, you know, what's the underlying theme in, with respect to the course. And uh, we hopefully we shouldn't take too long. We should have some time for questions at the end. So I'll first start again. These are all things you've probably heard of in the previous talks or from your own reading. But the Cambridge course, which is very different from other courses, is the fact that you spend quite a bit of time doing basic science before you go into your clinics. And if you look at the kind of subjects that you study, then you generally tend to look at how things work in first year. So things like physiology, biochemistry and anatomy, they get given different names in the university, but those are the basic subjects. And then you go on to talk about you know, when things go wrong or how drugs work in second year. And then you've got your uh, science, you know, free reign over what science you pick in your third year. Now, uh, just to add that the preclinical course is being revised as we speak, and we don't know exactly what form it will take in a few years, but I think for now that's how it's been for a very long time. And again, how does that fit into a broader framework? Well, you've got your zoomed in molecules right at the very bottom, your biochemistry, your pharmacology, and then you look at how systems work to maintain the body's own internal balances or hemostasis as we call it and then you also need to know particularly for the budding surgeon amongst you where everything is as well and again this is just something which uh, i also mentioned earlier in the q a this is your typical uh, dose of learning in the preclinicals for each course that you do so that's multiplied by three on average or four if you're in a second year and then in, in the clinicals, as I mentioned earlier, again, you essentially have three years worth of attachments. You start with the core, you then go into looking at your specialties, and then you look at a much more apprenticeship model of developing your competence before you go into the wards. And uh, you do have some flexibility for exploring some of your interests and that the teachings delivered across the whole region. So, so with that in mind, just as an introduction, you would say, well, okay, well, if I want to treat patients, I want to be a doctor, the, the scientists learning about diseases and developing new drugs that I can use, what, why do you need to do anything in between? And the thing is the, the picture is not so clear cut. So when you, even when you have a treatment that you know works, there's an awful lot of work to both work out how it's going to be used in which particular subtype of patients do you need to use with existing treatments, how long, what dose. And these are all the subtleties that are not worked out in the lab. So even if something is you know, proven to be safe and effective, that's not the end of the story. And particularly for a lot of things which are procedure based, or which you treat conditions which have a much longer outlook, it's not always easy to um, address it with a simple research that you need to be able to monitor your outcomes long term. And of course, that will also, and that's where you know, clinical audit comes, and also comparing your performance across you know, other hospitals or you know, countries as well. And then you go into the realms of health policy. So as you can see, the, you know, the, the clinical picture is actually, there's a lot of gray areas within it. So let's talk about a specific condition that's called normal pressure hydrocephalus or NPH. Now, most of you may not have heard of it because it's not particularly well known, but it's actually fairly common in people as they grow older. And the symptoms you have in NPH, they're usually what's called a triad of problems with walking, problems with cognition, and problems with bladder control. And usually people who have this condition also have large ventricles on the brain scan, which we'll talk about in a moment. 
And the interesting thing about it is that a lot of people who we have been diagnosed as Alzheimer's, who are diagnosed as Alzheimer's, actually have NPH and not Alzheimer's disease. And some people estimate that actually almost one fifth of people in a nursing home may have NPH as opposed to dementia. And the problem with that is that, why is that the case? It's because it's very difficult to tease it out between the different alternative diagnoses for that. And I'll talk about that as well in a second. Um, and another way of looking at it is how many people are actually diagnosed with the disease. And again, these figures are very difficult to ascertain, but some people have estimated that actually only 20% of people with the disease are actually diagnosed. The other 80% don't know about it. So let's just take a step back. If you want to understand why we treat it the way we do, we need to do some very basic principles of brain development. So the adult brain develops you know, in the embryo from a tube. And what happened, that includes both the brain and spinal cord. And as the embryo grows, the tube grows and the front bit of it, which will form the brain, grows disproportionately relative to the back of the tube. So as you can see, the brain here is essentially this vesicle here at the front, which keeps growing and mushrooms over the basic tube. And the reason why I'm talking about this is that what the remnants are of the center of the tube here, this will form the ventricular system in the adult. So as you can see here, if this grows, you will end up having two ventricles here and then further the ventricles going all the way down to the spinal cord. And this is what it would look like in the adult. So you have the first two ventricles, which are called the lateral ventricles, which is where a lot of the fluid, the brain fluid is produced, called cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. It will then go into the third ventricle, which is here, and then down something called the aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, and then the fluid will exit the tube, and cushion the brain on the outside into what's called the subarachnoid space until it's eventually absorbed into the venous system and returns back to the heart. And this is quite a dynamic circulation. So you produce about 20 mils of CSF every hour. So you can imagine any disturbance to that very fine balance can lead to problems quite quickly. So, as I said, in normal pressure hydrocephalus, you have a disturbance of you know, fluid circulation, which we're not entirely sure what causes it. And again, that's something I'll touch on later. But there is a treatment for it. And one of the oldest neurosurgical procedures is what's called putting in a shunt, or in this case, a ventricular peritoneal shunt if it goes to the tummy. So what you do, you will put a very thin catheter into the ventricular system, connected to a device called a valve under the scalp. And then the valve is connected to another tube, which can go down either into the peritoneal cavity of the abdomen, or sometimes the pleural cavity, or even the, uh, the heart, so the right atrium. And what happens is that this valve is a one-way system whereby if fluid goes over a certain pressure, it will then drain uh, excess cerebrospinal fluid into the other organ where it's absorbed. So if you have any condition where you have disturbed so, uh, CSF circulation because of an imbalance between production and absorption, shunting can help. Well, is, can shunting help with NPH? Um, yes, it can. And the studies so far have shown that more than four-fifths of patients, if they're correctly diagnosed, and they have a shunt, then they get better. And if you think of the economics, it's actually quite a cost-effective thing to do as well. And how do we know how many people are shunted? This is came from national databases. So I'm one of the um, leads for the UK shunt register, which captures all shunts done around the country. And as you can see, shunting for NPH, there's quite a large number of shunts which are done as people get older. These are just um, uh, ages of people primary shunting. So, so you'd say, well, okay, well, we can diagnose it. There's a treatment, so what's the problem here? Well, there's a number of challenges with managing NPH. 
And again, whether this is science or clinical practice, that's actually a combination. So the first one is the three symptoms that you use to diagnose MPH are extremely common as you grow old. So if you think about problems with walking, that's present. these are present in about one fifth of people over 60 and could be for all sorts of reasons, Parkinson's disease, arthritis, stroke, or just general frailty. Um, cognitive dysfunction is also very common. And of course, the big culprit here is Alzheimer's disease, but there's also a lot of other diseases which can cause dementia. And again, people as they grow older do run into bladder problems, either due to poor muscle control in women or prostate problems in their men. So how do you know who to treat or to, to diagnose and treat? And you can think of it in terms of a different stepwise approach. You can start with the first question of who should be referred for a specialist to evaluate for NPH. And that's not very expensive, but you need to have some form of criteria to see, well, is there a particular pattern of cognitive problem that is associated with NPH? As you start going down the more invasive tests, they tend to be more expensive and also have more of a risk. So the second question is, well, who should be scanned and how? So there are a number of markers that you can see with the ventricular system getting larger that you can use to stratify and decide. So usually patients tend to be referred after they've had some symptoms and a scan which is suggestive of that. And then the problem with it is, of course, that we don't have a clear link between understanding the physiology of the disease and the tests that we do. So, so there's been a number of hypotheses which um, speculate as to why people with NPH develop these symptoms. So that one of the predominant is called the hydrodynamic derangement hypothesis, which um, for some reason have disturbed dynamics and then it leads to expansion of the brain and leads to dysfunction. But there's also new hypotheses such as impaired um, flow of fluid through alternative systems, just like the brain lymphatics called the lymphatic system. And then of course you go into more invasive interventions, which generally tend to involve removing some fluid to simulate the effect of a shunt and seeing if somebody gets better. And this is where the problems start in terms of our current practice. Um, in that most tests have a good positive predictive value, but poor negative predictive values. And that essentially means that a positive predictive value means if the test comes up as positive, then you're likely to have the condition. Whilst the negative predictive values, if the test back is negative, how likely are you to not have the condition? So you generally have two types of tests that I'll talk about later. But one of the ones we use is something calculating the resistance to CSF outflow, R out, as you can see here. And generally speaking, the higher the R out, the more likely you are to have NPH. So as you can see here, the positive predicted value, as you increase the cutoff to 18, then if you have a positive test, then you're 94% likely to have the condition within that population. The problem is with all of these, the negative predictive value is very, very poor. So that means if the test doesn't show, uh, it is not suggestive of NPH, there's only, uh, there's a less than 20% chance that you've excluded the disease. So that's a problem because that means that you can never easily fully tell a patient, I don't think this treatment will help you. Um, now, so what, are, what other things can you do? So the gold standard is to do a lumbar puncture and then put what's called in a lumbar drain and then the patient stays in hospital for a few days whilst they're constantly draining fluid at a certain pressure level to simulate the shunt. The problem with that is, is purely logistics. If you, if you looked at the previous and have 700,000 people in the States could have NPH, that's a lot of hospital days and quite a lot of healthcare costs if you were to use the gold standard on everybody. And which has led to some people to say, well, fine, if you can't truly exclude it, shouldn't you just shunt everybody who you think has NPH? And the problem with that is that these people are of a certain age and above. 
And that would involve them having surgery, including drilling a hole in the head and putting a catheter through the brain. So that there is an element of risk there. And not only that, shunts are mechanical devices and can fail. So if you look at revision rates where another operation is needed, in adults, you have a 12, you know, a 13% revision rate within three months of the procedure, and then 17% within one year. So that's not really an option either. So, so this is the background to the clinical problem we have. And uh, this slide will just talk a bit about the project that we're doing, but um, this just says that in clinical research and clinical practice, you need lots of friends. So here, uh, this is an EU funded project. We have three universities, four hospitals and two companies involved in this. And if you want to tackle the problem in improving care for NPH, we've attacked it through three ways. The first one is developing better diagnostic tests. The second one is improving the clinical care with sharing best practice and integrating these tests. And then the third element is actually making data easily shareable between research and clinical practice so that we can use it for the benefit of both. So going back to a bit of basic science, I'll talk a bit about the infusion tests, which is one of the diagnostic approaches that I mentioned earlier when you calculate resistance to CSF outflow or R out. So you can model the fluid system in the brain like a circuit, just like you've probably covered electrical circuits in GCSE physics or if you're doing um, physics A level. You can model your battery, which is producing CSF. Um, and then you also have the compliance of the brain in that as, which can be modeled as a capacitor. And then you also have the absorption of CSF, which goes through a resistor. So the concept of resistance to CSF outflow can be modeled if you can measure the flow and you can also measure the pressure difference. You can think of it like a fancy version of Ohm's law. And if you have a, a shunt in the system, you can also model it by adding an extra resistor um, which opens an alternative route to the usual outflow CSF. So how can you calculate this? So this also involves a lumbar puncture, but instead of leaving a drain in, what you do is you connect it to a pressure transducer and you measure the pressure of fluid. And then you challenge the system by infusing fluid into the system. So you're essentially simulating flow. And what you're getting here is, as you can see, this is your intracranial pressure. Don't worry about these so much. If you look at the top line, you're measuring your baseline pressure, and then you start infusing fluid into the subarachnoid space and by extension, the intracranial compartment. And then you can measure how the pressure changes and then it eventually reaches a plateau. So from this, you can calculate, well, both your baseline pressure, but also more importantly, your resistance to CSF outflow, I mentioned earlier. And well, how does this help with this diagnosis? So if you think of problems of cerebrospinal fluid in terms of pressure and dynamics, you can group them to four big categories. Obviously, if you have an acute obstruction, such as a bleed, then you have increased intracranial pressure and also increased resistance. But in conditions such as NPH, you have normal pressure, as you can see here, but you have increased resistance to CSF outflow. And the studies have shown that the higher this resistance is, the more likely you are to benefit from treatment. But note that there is still the word likely in this. And this is, um, as you can see here, if you were to put your cut of up 18, then it's pretty clear cut. But between, 10 and 18, well, what about that? Should you, is it because patients will benefit or not? And would you be shunting unnecessarily? Um, this test did make the nice guidance, but it's still, there is a gray area. So what we're doing now is trying to combine it with a different test. And this involves uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So there's a technique called phase contrast MRI, which was developed by our French partners. And what you can do, you can focus on very specific areas of the brain and then model and measure the flow of fluid across those areas. 
and you can see both the arterial and the venous components and then also estimate the, the velocity and direction of CSF flow. And what they have found is that as compared to a normal individual, patients with NPH have a more hyperdynamic circulation with much higher velocities. So what we're doing and the hypothesis between this project is if we integrate infusion study data, so your resistance to CSF, with your phase contrast data, can you get a new diagnostic index which can be predictive? And for that, well, uh, doctors and physicists are not clever enough. We were also collaborating with mathematicians who are essentially applying machine learning approaches to look at both the signals derived from pressure measurements and flow measurements to try, if we do this in enough patients, to try and group patients and train the algorithm into the four diagnostic groups that I mentioned earlier. And we're sort of halfway there with this now. We're in the process of data collection. So that's the science bit. Now, how does this all fit with actually treating patients? And the first thing to note is that you need to think of the clinical pathway. So you need to think of the referral pathway, the tests you do and how this would work out and then eventually managing and treating things. And of course, with the constraints of COVID, this has become even more apparent. Um, if you look at, and you need to ask yourself, well, what is my ultimate objective? Which if it's all right, we want to treat more patients with NPH by, by treating them with a well-known treatment. You need to work backwards. So before you start successfully treating more patients, you need to successfully diagnose more patients, which means you actually need to be running tests on more patients and deciding which patients are likely to benefit from the test as well. So really tackling this requires you to go all the way back and even starting from the very basics of increasing awareness within general practitioners and neurologists about the possibility that the patient they think has dementia actually may have NPH. And we have a team which we are looking at more details around the symptoms, the cognitive symptoms, as well as the gait symptoms that can enable better diagnosis without doing further tests, which are expensive to do on everybody. And then the last thing is what we're also doing is um, trying to restructure the pathway because usually people with NPH can get worse over a number of months. And if you think about all the tests and what needs to be done, it takes a bit of time and that can take a number of months itself. So what we are doing is also restructuring the service so that all the tests can be done in two groups. And also bearing in mind, you need to do the imaging test before you start probing the system, which can skew your results. And the last thing, as I mentioned, you need to have evidence for health policy and changing and making sure at the end of the day, whatever you come up with, the NHS will pay for, at least in the UK. So you do need to collect sufficient data to demonstrate that what you're doing is effective. So there's lots of metrics that you need to convince, well, commissioners and managers that what you're doing is a good idea. Right, so that's the end of my talk. And I, I hope I've given you a bit of a flavor into the treatment itself or the one diagnostic self is itself is a very small part of trying to change how you, uh, you know, manage for, for a particular condition. So even if the treatment is developed to try and make it effective within clinical practice, there's a lot of extra work to do that. And as a doctor, you have a key role in making that happen. And the other thing, of course, understanding the concepts around everything else helps you understand how best to do that as well. Right, so that's the end of my talk. What time is it, 23? So Thanks, Alexis. I, the, uh, I know that people do have a lot of questions around things. So what I did, we did last year, which we may or may not, but um, I did, you know, I have clustered some general questions that people have come up with over the COVID times around, you know, FAQs about the course applications, but, you know, we can talk about things and I'm happy to take any questions that you might think are useful. 
Great. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in straight away, um, specifically about your talk. Um, and the first one um, uh, coming from Kai, which is how do different departments actually collaborate if they have information which is relevant to each other's research? So what's that mean? So, so uh, how do different departments actually collaborate if they have information which is relevant to each other's research? Well, that's quite a relevant point because a lot of the time research can be found in little silos. So um, the fact that we are working in a very collaborative um, you know, forum means that we do have to you know, take things very seriously in terms of data sharing, make sure it's anonymized. So there's a whole load of work on regulation when you work with patient data that needs to be addressed before you're able to combine data together and to, you know, try and improve things. And that's something that does take a lot of time. It's not very exciting, but it needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, and that's also particularly, I mean, we're all talking into medics here, but that is true in sort of any academic profession is it, that research can become very, you know, siloed, as you say. So I'm stealing that expression for, for all the rest of my talk. Thanks, Alexis. Um, and uh, this is from Eshin. I think this goes back to one of the first slides um, you showed us. Um, why is there a difference um, in the prevalence of NPH by gender? We're not sure, but again, it's very difficult to make a, you know tease that out because there's different healthcare presentation behaviors between you know genders as well. So there's a lot of questions that we don't understand why it's caused and hence why you have these differences. Okay, um, and then um, this is from Liliana, uh, which is, are there any environmental factors that can encourage or speed up the development of NPH? Uh, no, again, not that we're, there's been a lot of hypotheses, but nothing concrete that you could say, mm, this you know, could accelerate it or not, but it does, it is associated with a number of other conditions as well. So again, whether it's a risk factor affecting another you know coexistent condition is you know something that is again very difficult to tease out interesting um and then this is going back to when you uh one of the final slides you showed us about um uh sort of uh the the cost effectiveness of the efficacy of it um how long does it take from sort of working out a new procedure doing all the evaluation of it to it actually being implemented on the front line well, I think shunting is probably not a good example because it's one of the first procedures that was done in neurosurgery, so it's at least 70 years old now. Um, it depends on your trial, and certainly with COVID, it's made things, you know, if there is a will, then you can expedite them. But generally, with a new surgical procedure, if it's a variation of technique, then you would need to have some level of evidence that it is at least as safe and effective as something else. So you know, with all things being neutral and having a smooth time, usually five to 10 years. Okay. Um, so here is a question um, about uh, what's your opinion on uh, dementia villages? So they say, um, in one way, you can argue it improves their quality of life by allowing them to live in comfort of their illness or with their illness. On the other hand, the patients are arguably out of touch with reality. And is it actually a proper treatment? Well, it's interesting, but I think one, one thing to bear in mind with a lot of these is that um, when you work with patients, you can never apply a one size fits all. So with dementia, as with any illness, you have a spectrum from very mild symptoms to very severe symptoms. And you have to make a judgment on a case by case basis, depending both on the disease severity and the social context for that individual patient. So it may be that it's appropriate for people who don't have a support network who come and have severe symptoms, but equally it can't apply to everybody who might, they might have some mild memory problems, for example. Yeah. So I think one thing you always need to consider as a doctor is you need to individualize care. You can't make generalizations. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a question from uh, Garisha. Um, so when um, inserting the catheter and the shunt valve, um, can that cause any damage? So the process of inserting it, does it, can that cause any damage? It can. Um, usually you pick a part of the brain to insert it through that is less eloquent, as we call it. So it doesn't have 
a crucial function, like moving the other side of your body. Um, but usually that damage is minimal or negligible unless you have a complication such as bleeding when you do that. And that the risk of that is less than one in a hundred, which is why we don't shunt everybody and we think twice before proceeding with treatment. Mm. Um, uh, and here's a question. So uh, would you hold meetings with different practitioners regarding one individual patient so as to help provide a diagnosis or treatment? Yes, we in fact we run regular multidisciplinary meetings both to discuss uh, slightly less clear cases and also to monitor progress. So yes, depending on the um, depending on the case in question, but yes, we have meetings with both other medical specialists like neurologists, psychiatrists, or elderly physicians, and also other health um, therapists such as a, in this case psychologists and uh, physiotherapists um and so uh, sort of a double i'm gonna uh, smush two questions together um from roslyn um which it says um what research have you been directly involved in if any um and then also as i think related to that what is your favorite and least favorite thing about being a brain surgeon right well this research which i mentioned i am directly involved in that i'm the clinical lead for it and we are you know, leading on the research program, trying to synthesize everything together. Um, historically, I actually started off doing a very basic research in stem cells when I was a, a student as part of my medical degree. So, in fact, the exact area of research, I would say, if you're, think, if you're all are thinking of it, is it's not so important as much as, you know, having a good approach to asking the right question and then seeking the answer for it. Um, good and bad things of being a brain surgeon, if we start with the bad things, um, a lot of conditions you treat are quite serious. So you end up having to make life or death decisions on you know, a frequent basis. And that is, is never easy. Um, but And also you could think of it as the good side, that uh, sometimes you have the potential to treat somebody with a life-threatening condition and cure them. Yeah, very true. Um, so, um, so this goes going back to your talk. Um, this, is from, this is from Lauren. Do you know what sort of factors can cause um, the disturbance in the normal production of CSF? In this case, no, but we know that there are other conditions whereby you can have overproduction. Those are relatively rare. So for example, you can have, you know, in children, you know, benign tumors that the choroid plexus which produces CSF overproduces it. And these can be treated with a number of ways. But generally speaking with NPH, it's usually a problem more on the absorption side leading to expansion of the brain, but in a way that leads to structural dysfunction. So it's not as simple as overproducing it in this case. Okay. Um, and then this is from Eve, and she's, uh, if I'm interested in this, um, where could I look for research information um, or articles um, about things like normal pressure hydrocephalus um, for her personal statement? I think I pronounced that right. Yeah, Again, no, not, uh, not a doctor. Two schools, hydrocephalus versus <laughs> hydrocephalus, depending on the etymological preferences. Um, well, there are obviously research, uh, research uh, article databases like PubMed, for example, where you can look up, you know, uh, peer reviewed publications, which sometimes have reviews on the subject. In terms of more general knowledge, it is a bit patched, and that's one of the things that we've struggled, you know, one of the objectives of this project, we are producing better patient and care information leaflets because there's not a lot out there. It sometimes falls as a little subset onto a dementia support website or otherwise, but it's not a, you know, a very well-known condition and probably your best bet is looking at, you know, reputable scientific papers on places like PubMed. Great. Um, and well, again, as the historian talking, I think this is a good question. Um, so you mentioned that um, you're able to treat MPH despite not necessarily knowing what is the exact cause of the overproduction of the cerebrospinal fluid in the first place. How common is this in um, medicine and treatment, uh, i.e. finding a solution without necessarily understanding the full issue or cause? Uh, very common. <laughs> 
So whilst you should always question and see, do we understand things a lot of the time, if you know an effective treatment is out there, and historically a lot of treatments that we've inherited now were shown to be effective before the advent of you know, detailed techniques to understand their basis. So we're in this sort of, there's almost an interplay between things that we know work and trying to understand why they work. And then on the other hand, how does our understanding of a condition lead us to having better treatments? And these two go hand in hand. But the main thing is to always be able to capture data to show that what you're doing is both safe and effective. Yeah. Um, and then a, uh, sorry, um, this is from Malika. Um, how might we begin to differentiate between someone who has MBH, uh, NPH, sorry, um, versus someone who might just be having uh, diabetes or dementia? I'm just saying from what I know about both, they would display very similar symptoms. No, and that's, that's part of the challenge, and it's a good question. So we are looking at, for example, if we are trying to improve the initial diagnostic testing before we start scanning, we are looking, for example, the psychologists um, looking at particular patterns of cognitive deficit. So what we're finding now is that people with NPH tend to have more problems with processing speed, whilst people with Alzheimer's tend to have more problems with um, episodic memory and things that what, you know, what happened yesterday, what did they eat for lunch today? Um, and so, in fact, at, even at the clinic, sometimes whilst to investigate people who think have NPH and then go into further tests, some people we then redirect to the dementia clinic. So we are starting to tease out more of the subtle details, even at the diagnostic stage. So you can start with that and also the pattern of gait problems is slightly different from Parkinson's disease, for example. So again, as part of the project, we've developed a, a gait app that breaks the person walking into a stick figure. And then we're analyzing the patterns and comparing that with other uh, gait disturbance problems. And then we've got, um, so this isn't, specifically about MPH, but it's related to neurological diseases. So, um, so this is from uh, Mohammed, who says, uh, why is it that certain ethnicities appear to be more vulnerable to such diseases? Is it to do with environmental factors, diet, so on and so on? Well, it, again, a difficult one to give a generic answer because sometimes, well, it could be because of genetics or it could be because of shared environment. Sometimes it's difficult to tease apart. So a lot of studies have looked at, you know, for example, people who migrate to different countries. Um, I, probably the best example of geographical epidemiology, I'd say, is in um, multiple sclerosis. So if you're interested in that, you know, a lot of work has been done on um, latitude and risk of multiple sclerosis. Again, not a clear-cut case but a lot of work has been done there interesting um i want to ask you more about that but i'm conscious of the, stu of the students questions um so this is possibly um uh a, a, a far broader uh question this uh, from al hassan um so um what are the broader implications of an aging population on the nhs well a lot <laughs> Um, you know, we, we, in fact, you know, we know that with aging, um, you know, people's health care needs generally go up and to some extent it does pose more challenges. And I'd say it's important in not just the NHS, but also health and social care together. Um, already we're seeing, you know, had, we saw the issues of rationing, especially over COVID, and I think this will only, you know, with projected figures, become more of an issue. So, certainly, you know, there is a mismatch between what you would say optimal care and what resources you have available. So, I think that's something that, um, you know, funding is ultimately determined by public opinion. So, um, we shall see whether funding improves in the longer term in terms of real increase. So a, a follow-up question, um, I've lost the name as well, which was if funding wasn't, if, if, uh, if funding, uh, if we could ignore the issue of funding, what is the one thing that you would introduce um, with regards to neurological or treatment for neurological disease or problems? 
Well, that's a very broad question. Um, I think if we narrow it to, for example, you know, these kinds of talk, the conditions we talked about, funding itself is not necessarily the only issue because it also needs to involve a culture change. So as I mentioned here, if people don't think of a diagnostic possibility such as NPH, then you will not be investigating it, even if you have a healthcare system that has sufficient provision. So I would say, even if you have funding, you need to decide how to target it. And you know, if you look at the states, the states is a good example to compare with. The outcome metrics are not necessarily better in all conditions, even though there's more funding per capita. Um, so I think, you know, if you had a lot of things that you would change is you need to use resources to improve education as well. And also, of course, you know, spend money to research, develop new treatments, but that's usually what we tend to hear. But actually there's a lot of treatments that are, are out there and are effective, but they've either not been rolled into a service or they're not available in the part with that actually you know, treats a high number of patients. So developing the treatment whilst we, most funding goes into that, there's still a lot of work to do after that treatment has been shown to work. Yes, very interesting. Um, this is a question um, about sort of pathways in medicine, um, which I think hopefully you can answer. So uh, this is from a student who wants to know, what do you think is the best pathway into paediatric neurosurgery? So would it be better to specialise into neurosurgery and then subspecialise into paediatrics or vice versa? Well, that's a very simple one. Paediatric neurosurgery is neurosurgery training. And then you would subspecialize in the pediatric element for about one to two years after training. So you would need to go down the neurosurgical path. Okay, thank you. That was quicker than I thought it was going to be. That's handy. Yeah. Um, uh, this is um, so. This is from um, uh, so. Could a new disease or complications arise, um, such as an infection, when undergoing extended lumbar drainage? Could a new complication? Yeah, so arise? so could so could something new happen, or yes, could so could new complications arise uh, through trying to fix the problem through? Um, well, of course, yes, and there's certainly any invasive test has risks, and the main one that we worry about it is rare again, but you could introduce an infection into the nervous system. So, for example, you could cause a meningitis, or it could cause an epidural abscess. So those are the things you worry about most. You could cause bleeding, epidural bleeding. Again, we have to advise patients to stop their antiplatelet medication if they're on that. So things like aspirin or clopidogrel. So a lot of these patients have comorbidities such as heart disease. And so you could envisage that even by stopping that, there's a small chance they could run into trouble from stopping it. So there are these risks, but again, these are quite low, again, in the realm of 1% or less. So you have to justify that the reason you're doing it is worthwhile if you were to able to treat them effectively. Yeah. Um, so this is a question from uh, Amelia. Um, do you believe that the future uh, of neuroscience will be more focused on non-invasive methods? And if it is, what does that mean for the future of neurosurgery? Well, I think the trend of any type of surgery is to go to um, less invasive methods and essentially surgery becomes more targeted but certainly there will always be a role for an intervention so if you take brain tumors as an example which is another area i work in um, there are some tumors of the brain which are treated purely through medical means such as cns lymphoma and some tumors which have a lot worse prognosis which still require surgery However, even for lymphoma, you still need to do a surgical procedure to establish the histological diagnosis. So um, there is a role for surgery, but hopefully as things progress, then it becomes more targeted in very specific cases and less invasive. Uh, but there is always a role for, you know, some things are very effectively treated surgically. Um, and then this is a question uh, from Krish, which is saying um, that, uh, Neurosurgery is famously uh, chaotic and busy, um, but does it get easier as you progress along in your career? It depends where you're working. Um, 
as a, um, a, a politician's answer, Alexis. The um, the well, I think as with any surgical specialty, there is the emergency aspect of a specialty and the non-emergency aspect. And yes, emergency neurosurgery is very chaotic. It's time critical. If somebody has a brain bleed from, say, a road traffic collision, it goes to theatre straight away. And this is what you usually see in most action dramas or equivalent. But equally, there is the planned aspect of this, which is controlled and boring and should be boring, which with it, you make sure that you don't have any dramas. So I wouldn't say that's any more chaotic than any other specialist as a planned elective aspect to it. So we try and keep things nice and controlled and boring. So it depends. If you're into <laughs> trauma, then you'll end up being more on the chaotic side. So there are flavours within each specialty. Um, and this is a question from uh, Utbar. Um, what is your favourite surgery to perform? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> question. I'm going to give a slightly, you know, long-winded answer in that, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons you do surgery is to actually make an impact on somebody. So I tend to think of it that, you know, you can do very simple surgery, like drilling a hole and releasing a blood clot or doing some very complex tumor removal. But at the end of the day, the importance of the surgery, I tend to link it to what the impact has on the patient. So I'm not really too fussed about, you know, how difficult or easy it is because you're there to make sure it goes to plan and safely, even though it's easy. For some of you playing, uh, you know, if you play instruments, you could think of it to, um, you know, playing Mozart versus Rachmaninoff. You know? They're both difficult to play well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a good, I like that. Um, uh, and then, um, sorry, I've just lost my um, place. Um, is there, a, so, so yeah, um, what initially attracted you to neurosurgery and the research into neurosurgery as well, or neuroscience, I should say? So I, as a medical student mentioned earlier, I did a PhD in neuroscience and stem cell biology. I hadn't had much exposure to neurosurgery at all. Um, I considered lots of career options after qualifying, including neurology, cardiology, ophthalmology, obstetrics even. But then I did do one rotation in neurosurgery as a second year junior doctor. That was when I decided because I liked the fact that it was an interventional aspect which required skill in addition to the neuroscience aspect which uh, interested me. So I think it just combined the two, but it was very much a decision just came naturally quite late down the line. Great. Um, and then I'm conscious of your time, Alexis. So if you've got time for if you've got time for a few more. Oh, yeah, great. Um, so this is from Faith. Um, so is it well, within medical um, schools and departments, is there an acceptance cap on what speciality you can branch into? Into medical school. So so in medical, so uh, sort of after I mean, after you've done your um, your six years, is there a cap on what speciality you can branch into? Yes, in fact, um, getting into specialty either at three years or five years post-qualification is quite a bit of a bottleneck. So whilst we mentioned earlier the competition ratios for getting into Cambridge Medicine about six to one, in some of the more competitive specialties, you look at 40 to one or 60 to one. So it's uh, a lot more competitive. And equally, there are some specialties who are undersubscribed. Um, so, for example, in neurosurgery, there are about, well, there used to be 24 places a year nationally. Now it's down to about 16. It does vary from year to year. And so you have to prepare well for it and have the right CV and the right things to make sure that your application is highly scored. So it depends on the specialty you want to do. But there's no, yes, the, the numbers are very much regulated because you have to go into a training program and uh, like in neurosurgery, there's only 33 hospitals around the country who actually do this. So you'll have about 20 trainees in each hospital or so across all years. Out of interest, what are some of the um, the less competitive or the under or the under um, not understaffed? What, what what ones 
could do well, with a few more. Relatively more uh, undersubscribed, then you are looking at probably competition between one in four to one in six, something like that. Again, this varies from year to year, so I wouldn't want to make any other assumption. But for example, in a few years ago, I think psychiatry was undersubscribed. General practice does vary from year to year, so there's lots of ups and downs there. But at the end of the day, if you're you know, doing well um, and maintain competitive in whatever you do, the main aspect about medicine is the better you do, then the more choice you have in terms of specialty and geography. And usually involves a trade-off between those two things that you know, some people who are um, you know, dead set in neurosurgery don't mind if they're, they, you know, they do this in Belfast or Glasgow, say, and they live in London. While some people actually take a sort of broader view of you know, their work-life balance, they will actually, I definitely want to stay close to where friends or family are and then they make their specialty choice from that. So there is a trade-off between both specialty and location, but generally speaking, the more, the better you do in your exams and the better you do in all your CV points, then the more choice you have. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and here's a question. Okay, yeah. Um, so roughly, um, what sort of, uh, how is your time split between time actually practicing neurosurgery and uh, time spent on research? So it's about a three to two split. I tend to operate about once a week and I have a clinic or two clinics a week.